In the video, they were repetitively saying that this individual, this Catholic quote-unquote exorcist, that he was qualified by the Vatican, and they were putting him as a public spectacle. And multiple different times through the video, they were saying he's like the only one, one of the only um, you know Catholic priests in uh, all of North America or in America that is a qualified exorcist or something like that. I'm not drawing any huge conclusion out of that. I just found it interesting and a little weird how they just continually kept saying how he was a qualified exorcist you know he was trained by the vatican he had that that qualification you know and i could see very well in the future especially with the push of the new world uh the the one world religion where the v vatican and the catholic church is going to be a major piece of that where they could say like these different religious practices need to fall under the qualifications of the vatican and i believe uh one thing that they could try to make fall under that category could possibly be um, deliverance. I find it interesting how they would put, you know, a uh, Catholic priest in, uh, like, in a good light, per, um, per se, but they probably wouldn't do that with uh, an actual deliverance minister, right? The title of my message actually is uh, to watch out for the assault on the deliverance ministry. I believe that the enemy uh, is launching assault, has been, you know, launching assaults against the deliverance ministry. And what I'm going to be talking about tonight is how to watch out for those attacks against the deliverance ministry, how to be able to spot them. For anybody who's really been paying attention to what's been going on, you know, in the church, especially in the church in America over the past five, ten years or so, obviously deliverance ministry has been exploding um, very dramatically. There's been a lot of deliverance ministries popping up. A lot more people have been receiving deliverance on a mass scale like real, I mean, maybe back in the days of the apostles, but really like never before. Um, so many people are receiving deliverance, and I believe so many people are starting to receive revelation of the deliverance ministry as well, too. And there's actually a distinction between those two things, but I'm going to be talking about that later. But, um, you know, I want to talk about this tonight because I believe with this fact that the deliverance ministry is growing so much that the enemy is going to be launching assaults and is launching assaults against the deliverance ministry. Now, there's still not enough people involved in deliverance ministry. There's still very scarce. But um, still, nevertheless, God is raising up a lot of people at the same time. So praise God for that. That's truly amazing. Um, I honestly do believe that every church should be involved in deliverance ministry. Every church should have some uh, form of ministry of deliverance that they do, even if it's not directly the pastor that's doing all of the, the deliverance. Um, because, you know, Jesus was constantly casting out demons everywhere that he went. You know, that was one of the primary things that he did on this earth. So, you know, if churches are going to look like the ministry of Jesus Christ, you would think that they would all be involved in the ministry of deliverance. Especially with the internet today, the ministry of deliverance can grow so rapidly. Unlike before the internet where, you know, people couldn't really find out about deliverance easily. Now, if your brick and mortar church doesn't preach on deliverance or practice deliverance, you can easily go on the internet and start being, uh, you know, involved in or being exposed to the ministry of deliverance. So it can really grow on a rapid scale, unlike it, you know, it couldn't before. And I believe God is using the internet, you know, to uh, further uh, advance the deliverance ministry. But, um, you know, the enemy is going to try to withstand that, I do believe. Uh, back in the days of Paul, you know, Paul actually got arrested for doing deliverance in the book of Acts chapter uh, 16 or Acts uh, chapter 19. He actually got arrested for deliverance. And I don't think that we should think it as an impossible thing that something like that could happen in the near future. I, be I believe it's probably even happening in other places around the world that we are not familiar with. But um, I just want people to be aware of that reality that, uh, you know, there's actually the potential to be arrested for doing deliverance. And I actually believe one of the reasons why the Pharisees and the scribes hated Jesus so much is because of the deliverance that he was doing. That is something that people don't really talk about oftentimes, many times, when they talk about the reasons why people hated Jesus. Jesus Christ. They don't talk about the fact that one of the main reasons why they hated Jesus so much is because of the deliverance that he was doing. If you read, especially through the book of Mark, you will see the Pharisees and the scribes just infuriated when he would do a deliverance many times, right? So, um, Anyways, I believe the enemy is going to try to withstand this uh, movement of the deliverance ministry because if the, the movement of deliverance ministry catches and goes worldwide, which it already has in some sense, of course, it's already been there in some sense, of course, but if it continues to grow and continue to grow at the rate in which it will, the kingdom of darkness will just be 
utterly destroyed, you know what I mean? I believe that there will be, you know, like a worldwide revival if uh, Deliverance really starts to continue to pick up speed, right? Um, so, you know, one of the reasons why I believe this is the case with, you know, there being a major revival with the deliverance spreading is because deliverance attracts people to the kingdom of God. Jesus Christ said, if I cast out demons by the spirit of God, truly the kingdom of God has come unto you. So when deliverance takes place, the kingdom of God is actively coming unto people. I believe deliverance attracts people to the kingdom of God, and it can especially have that effect today on how deliverance can be spread on such a mass scale, right? And I wanted to read a little bit about this concept in Matthew chapter 4, about how deliverance attracts people to the kingdom of God, or deliverance attracts people to, um, you know, to, uh, the Lord Jesus. In Matthew chapter 4, verse 23, it says, And Jesus went about all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, and preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing all manner of sickness and all manner of disease among the people. And his fame went through all out, uh, went through all out Syria, and they brought unto him all the people that were take um, all the people that were taken with diverse diseases and torments, and those that were possessed with devils, and those that were lunatic, and those that had the palsy, and he healed them. And it goes on to say, and there were followed him great multitudes of people from Galilee and Neapolis and from Jerusalem and from Judea and from beyond Jordan. So we see when Jesus was healing people and doing deliverance, what was the result of that? Masses of people started to follow him. And also even prior to that, when he did deliverance in, uh, you know, even a little bit earlier, it says that his fame went all throughout the, the region, right? And people started to bring people to Jesus. Friends of friends started to bring people to Jesus. So you see that multiplication effect with deliverance and healing right there, where, you know, people that heard about the deliverance and the healing or experienced the healing and the deliverance, they started to bring their friends. And I believe this is what happens when you get involved in the ministry of deliverance. God will supernaturally start to bring people to you for you to be able to pray deliverance for. I know I've definitely seen this in my own life myself, where people will just say, I have no clue how I, you know, came across your channel or I saw you in a dream or a friend of a friend told me, a, a mutual friend that received deliverance told me about your ministry you know um, I believe that same thing happens within people that are involved in deliverance ministry I've seen that in my life and I liken it onto this passage right here where it says that they brought all of these different people his fame spread abroad right and we see you know it says that his fame spread abroad now I by no means would try to say that I you know my ministry has the sim similar kind of magnitude of that situation but still nevertheless the deliverance ministry in general has this kind of effect upon human beings that it, it, it attracts people to the kingdom of God and then the result is we see right here a great uh, multitude ended up following Jesus afterwards so I believe you know when the kingdom of God or when the power of God is shown People will be attracted to follow Jesus Christ because we see right after the demonstration of the, the power of God via healing, via deliverance, people follow Jesus Christ after that, right? So when you get involved in deliverance ministry, you will become, uh, you know, you'll, be, you'll become targeted by the enemy, but you'll also become a, a beacon of light for the kingdom of God. You know what I mean? You have the, the effect on both ends, right? We see in Acts chapter 19, verse 15, it says, And the evil spirit answered and said, Jesus I know, and Paul I know, but who are you, or who are ye? So, you know, we see um, the demons actively had a knowledge of who Paul was. It was almost as though Paul was on the radar of the kingdom of darkness, right? So we see, you know, when Jesus did deliverance, his, his fame was spread abroad. And then we see uh, one of the effects of Paul doing deliverance that he was on the radar of the map of the enemy. So we see, you know, both of these things will happen when you get involved in the ministry of deliverance. And, um, you know, when you get involved in the ministry of deliverance, actually you'll go through more attacks sometimes than somebody who's not involved in the ministry of deliverance. There's many weird, obscure things that have gone wrong or interruptions when I'm trying to do deliverance with people. You know, like there'll just be people randomly bursting into the room, messing up things or whatever. Just different weird, obscure attacks will happen when you get involved in the ministry of deliverance, you know. Um, but... At the same time, God meets you with the grace to be able to endure those attacks. So, you know, you can't run away from your calling to do deliverance, especially if you're already learning about deliverance and you're already involved in deliverance to some degree. You're already targeted by the enemy, you know what I mean? It's too late to turn back even if you're this far learning about deliverance ministry. I know the enemy has tempted some people in thinking that, oh, the attacks are so hard, the attacks are too difficult. 
Um, if I just turn around or if I just lessen the amount that I'm doing for the kingdom of God, if I start to attack the kingdom of darkness less, maybe the attacks will lighten up. But no, once you've been targeted by the enemy, the enemy is going to come to destroy you, you know, no matter what you, if you stop working for God's kingdom, if you continue to work for God's kingdom, the devil's coming to try to destroy you either way that you go. So, you know, if you've already made it this far, there's no point in trying to soften the amount that you do for the kingdom of God, because you just need to continue to keep looking forward. You know, there may be even some of you here tonight that have experienced a similar thing and thinking that, oh, there's so much pressure, there's so much attacks from the enemy, I'll just lessen the amount, I'll just lessen the low, the amount that I'm doing for the kingdom of God. You're making a mistake if you think that uh, that's going to work out for you. Actually, you'll probably just put yourself under subject to actually being penetrated by the enemy, the enemy actually being able to land attacks on you. So there's no point in looking back. And we see that actually uh, the enemy tried to get Jesus to stop doing deliverance in the book of Luke chapter 13, verse 31 through 32. It says, in the same day, there were certain of the Pharisees saying unto him, get thee out and depart hence for Herod will kill thee. And he said unto him, go tell ye that fox, behold, I cast out devils and I do cures today and tomorrow. And the third day I shall be perfected. So we see right here, um, you know, that Jesus is saying, no, I'm going to continue to keep casting out demons. So what can we see that the Pharisees were trying to do? Trying to get him to stop casting out demons. So sometimes a religious spirit will come and try to tell you to stop casting out demons, try to tell you to stop being involved in deliverance ministry, etc. So we see right here that, uh, you know, Jesus was at one point pressured with the um, the idea from these uh, Pharisees to try to stop doing deliverance. We see, you know, I believe that it was a religious spirit that was trying to get Jesus to stop doing deliverance. Uh, but he said, you know, that he's not going to, obviously. So, like I said earlier, one of the main reasons why the Pharisees hated Jesus so much is because of the deliverance that he was doing. And why does the enemy hate deliverance so much? What is one of the main reasons is because... Deliverance publicly puts the kingdom of darkness to an open shame, unlike any other ministry. Other ministries can, yes, put the kingdom of darkness to an open shame, but the ministry of deliverance does it so blatantly and so outwardly in the open, like you can literally physically see the kingdom of darkness being put to an open shame. Colossians chapter 2, verse 15 says, And having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly. Or other trans another translation says, and he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them in it. So if anybody ever tries to convince you that, oh, you shouldn't do deliverance ministry publicly, you shouldn't cast out demons publicly, you should go and do it privately, we shouldn't do it in the church, we shouldn't have it on the internet, anything like that. You know, you can tell them, well, you know, Jesus put the enemy to uh, an open shame publicly. That's, you know, what we see right here. This verse is communi communicating that he publicly put the enemy to an open shame. And we see from 1 John chapter 3, it says, uh, For this purpose, the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. So Jesus came to destroy the works of the devil publicly. And that's one of the reasons why the Pharisees hated him so much, because he was publicly destroying the kingdom of darkness. So if you want to be like Jesus Christ, you can publicly destroy the kingdom of darkness. I bet you never, you know, heard that from like a Sunday school teacher or anything like that. But, you know, really to be like Jesus, you would publicly destroy the kingdom of darkness. That's what he was constantly doing, going around and destroying the kingdom of darkness publicly, right? That was one of the main things that he was involved in, um, in doing. I wanted to read another passage to you guys. You don't have to turn there. You're probably familiar with this passage. It says in Matthew chapter 12, Verse 23, and all the people were amazed and said, is this not the son of David? And Jesus was just recently casting out, out a demon. Um, and it go, the passage goes on to say, but when the Pharisees heard it, they said, this fellow doth not cast out devils, but by Beelzebub, the prince of devils. So another reason why the enemy hates deliverance so much is not only the fact that it it set, uh, that deliverance sets people, uh, the, the reason why the enemy hates deliverance so much is because it sets people free. People spiritually get set free, but it also makes people in awe of the power of God. And I believe there's even an element in which right here, people were recognizing the identity of Jesus Christ because of the deliverance that was being done. So could we therefore conclude that people can better recognize the identity of Jesus Christ 
uh, because of the ministry of deliverance. I believe that's a possible thing that we can conclude from this passage. But still, nevertheless, one of the points that I wanted to get across is there's just so many things that the ministry of deliverance can do, and that's why the enemy hates it so much. You know, I've even seen people's gifts. I've seen a specific one time a, a gift being unlocked, a gift of singing being unlocked in somebody after receiving deliverance. There's things that, and this is th something that I believe God is leading me to say. There are things that will happen because people receive deliverance, but those people are not even aware of it. There will be changes and shifts and different things that happen in people's lives, but they don't connect the dots and realize that was because they received deliverance. So if you're ever discouraged and you've prayed for people and you haven't seen a lot of breakthrough, you can know that there's probably a lot of things that are actually shifting in the spirit realm when you do deliverance, but the people are just not cognitively they're not consciously making the connection that the positive things that they've noticed in their life are happening because they have received deliverance right that's really important to understand that a lot of people don't accredit certain things to um, them receiving deliverance i believe there's a lot of people where they just receive deliverance directly from god and they don't even recognize that so how much more would they possibly not recognize the positive uh, effects of deliverance upon their lives so, you know, shifting away from talking about that, I believe one of the things the enemy wants to do is try to discredit the ministry of deliverance. I believe this is something he's trying to do even during this hour and, you know, all the time. But, uh, yeah, he specifically wants to try to discredit the ministry of deliverance by pointing out the errors of uh, deliverance ministers or different kinds of ministers, right? It says in Mark chapter 3, verse 21, and when his friends heard of this, they went out to lay hold on him, for they said he is beside himself. So we see the Pharisees accuse Jesus of working with the power of the devil. And we see that his own friends said that he's insane. So, you know, we see the religious people will try to accuse uh, people that are doing deliverance of... Uh, make an accusation that they're working with the power of the devil and then people that are just ignorant or people that don't have faith yet will say that you're crazy say that you're insane right a lot of people are aware of the passage where the pharisees accuse jesus of working with the power of the enemy but i want you guys to be aware of this as well too where just people that are in the world or ignorant or that don't have faith yet will accuse you of being crazy or accuse you of being insane uh, when you start to do deliverance or talk about spiritual warfare, start to talk about fighting against demons. It says that they literally went out to lay hold on him. They were trying to go and physically restrain Jesus and tell him that he's insane. You know, when, you, when you read through this passage in the King James Version, you might not really uh, realize that. But yeah, as it, you know, they were trying to say that he's insane. And this is right after he started doing the ministry of deliverance. I wanted to read Mark chapter 5, verse 15. It says, and they come to Jesus and see him that was possessed with the devil and that he, uh, and had the legion sitting clothed and in his right mind. And they were afraid. So the people um, in the surrounding region in Mark chapter 5, it says that they were afraid after this man had received deliverance. Notice how it says that they were afraid after he received deliverance. You know, it says that he was clothed sitting in his right mind. I believe that's the reason why they were afraid because he was in his right mind. They were afraid that, you know, this deliverance actually worked, that this individual was so radically changed. And I've said it before, and I'll say it again, that is one thing that you can point to um, when talking to the naysayers or when talking to religious people is the fruit, the fruit that comes out of the ministry of deliverance where people's lives are radically changed, where people are set free, they grow closer with God, they can overcome sin a lot easier, they have more sound mind, they overcome demonic voices in their mind. So many different things I could just continue to keep going going down a list but you can point to the fruit you know what i mean because uh when you point to the fruit there's nothing that, that they could really say how could so much good fruit be coming out of the ministry of deliverance if it wasn't of god right so that's a good thing that you can point to anyways i wanted to turn to mark chapter 9 now though in uh verse 14 so this is the situation where the apostles were trying to cast out a demon and they were unsuccessful and um i wanted to read starting in verse 14 it says and when he he came to his disciples and saw a great multitude about them and the scribes questioning with them. I just want to stop right there. My question is, what were the scribes questioning the apostles about? We see right here that the, apost uh, that the scribes were questioning the apostles. And this is in the context 
let me remind you, this is in the context of right after the apostles failed to do a deliverance. So would it be fair to conclude that uh, the scribes were questioning the apostles about the fact that they just, you know, had an unsuccessful deliverance? I think, I think that's the only possible conclusion that we can come to because that is the situation at hand in this context, right? And it goes on to say, And straightway all the people, when they beheld him, were greatly amazed, and running to him, saluted him. And he asked the scribes, What question ye with him? And one of the multitude answered and said, Master, I have brought uh, unto thee my son, which hath a dumb spirit. So we see that my hypothesis is confirmed right here, because you know he's asking, What question ye with him? And then the man comes out of the multitude and talks about the situation where his son needs deliverance. So I believe, once again, like I said, that we can validly conclude that the scribes, we're questioning the apostles about the unsuccessful deliverance. And this is what a Pharisee or a scribe will do, is if uh, somebody cannot perfectly deliver somebody, they will try to question the ministry of deliverance. You know what I mean? Like if uh, you know everything's not completely perfect or the demons aren't cast out completely instantly, uh, Pharisee type like people will come to try to question and discredit. And uh, if we know anything about the scribes and Pharisees, when they were asking questions, they were asking questions to try to discredit. They were asking questions out of a disgenuine place. Not like they were actually genuinely curious, but they were asking questions a vast majority of the time, pretty much 100% of the time, to try to discredit. So I believe that's validly what we can conclude was going on in this situation right here, that the, the scribes were trying to discredit the deliverance because the apostles were unsuccessful. And I believe the devil is on the same mission to do the same thing nowadays, where if a deliverance minister is found out that they're in sin, or or, or a deliverance minister is not able to deliver somebody, or, or here's another other thing where somebody goes to a deliverance ministry but they don't turn away from their sin they don't read their bible they don't take their thoughts captive and then they go and say oh the deliverance ministry doesn't work you know what i mean like they put in no effort in their walk and then they go and uh, give a bad report about the deliverance ministry that is one way that the devil will try to discredit the ministry of deliverance is by using somebody that didn't even really put an effort to be delivered in the first place they didn't even have faith to be delivered in the first place and then they go and complain and say that deliverance ministry doesn't work right anyways that's just what came to my mind but um, you know, I believe the enemy will try to use the failure of deliverance ministers to try to discredit deliverance. You know, I definitely do believe that is the case. Um, me and my wife actually a little while ago were um, watching this minister and he wasn't a deliverance minister, probably somebody that you guys m maybe aren't even familiar with. But anyways, we were watching him and he took down all of the videos off of his channel because he like uh you know messed up about some prophecy or something and then he re-uploaded a new video and somebody commented under the comment section and said my faith is completely shaken like i'm just i don't know what to, to do with my life i don't know what to do with myself i don't know how i can go on with, with my faith i don't remember exactly what they said but they said something along the lines of they don't know what they're going to do with their faith. They don't know where their faith's at now because this minister took down all of his videos. And I'm thinking to myself, that's absolutely insane. You had faith in man. You know what I mean? Like if uh, if somebody's ministry coming down or somebody, you know, uh, leaving their ministry behind or they, they it comes out that they were in sin or something like that. If that shakes your faith, then, uh, you know, you need to do some serious soul searching in a situation like that. Now, I understand like if somebody's newly converted and that person played a big role in their you know, in them coming to the Lord. I understand how their faith could be shaken, but you need to come to the place in your walk where your beliefs are established regardless if every minister that you follow just goes off the face of the planet and you never hear from them again. You need to come to the place where your beliefs are not shaken even if all of those ministers just go off the face of the earth all of a sudden and you never hear from them again. You know what I mean? That's, that's really important. I praise God that I've come to the place in my walk where... Even if somebody that I follow that currently has a great influence over me, they just, you know, turn away. Even if they, like, turn away from the faith or become an atheist or something, that's not going to shake my faith. You know what I mean? Because not, not only is my faith in Jesus Christ, 
But my beliefs of my doctrine are founded in the Word of God as well. Too many people, yes, they have their faith in Jesus, but as far as their beliefs go, they can be easily altered based on what a minister does or, or doesn't do. So anyways, the conclusion, I know I kind of went off track there, but the conclusion of what I was trying to get at is one way the enemy will try to discredit, or the one way the enemy is trying to attack the ministry of deliverance is by discrediting it. Um, another way, another thing that I wanted to make you guys aware of is even sometimes a genuine Christian could be used by the enemy to attack deliverance ministry. So therefore, we can't say that everybody does, that doesn't understand a Christian could have a demon or doesn't, doesn't agree with you perfectly. That doesn't mean they're a heretic. That doesn't mean that they're uh, lost. I wanted to read a passage that further, uh, you know, brings up this uh, or, or solidifies this concept. In Mark chapter 9, verse uh, 38 through 40, it says, And John answered him, saying, Master, we saw one casting out devils in thy name, and he followeth not us. And we forbade him, because he followeth not us. But Jesus said, Forbid him not, for there is no man which can do a miracle in my name that can lightly speak evil of me. For he that is not against us is on our part. So I find that very interesting right there that John, John the Apostle, you know, um, was used by the enemy to try to prohibit somebody from doing deliverance. One of the direct apostles of Jesus Christ went up to a man and told him to stop doing deliverance. You know what I mean? So I hope that further solidifies that concept to you guys that even a genuine Christian could be. And, and you know, that's the thing. Out of me doing the ministry of deliverance, the, the more times that I've seen people attack the, the ministry of deliverance has actually come from Christians rather than lost people. You know what I mean? As interesting as that may sound, I guess, you know, it kind of makes sense. Um, but, uh, yeah, I find that very interesting. Maybe some of them, yeah, are, are lost. They're not genuine Christians, but at the same time, both. Both could be used by the enemy, genuine Christians or even, fal obviously, false converts as well, too. So, um yeah, I guess what you have to figure out in that situation is if somebody is deliverance ignorant or they're actually, you know, waging war against uh, the deliverance ministry. And I have a video about that on my topic or on my channel, on my YouTube channel. If, uh, you know, somebody's just deliverance ignorant or if somebody is actually being used by the enemy to deliberately war against the ministry of deliverance. And you guys could check that video out if you want. But anyways, um, I wanted to read a verse to you guys with regards to getting in deliverance ministry. It says in second Corinthians chapter six, verse uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 6, it says, And having a readiness to revenge all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. I see many people that want to get into, um, you know, uh, ministry nowadays that are still in, engaged in willful sin. And, uh, you know, that's a very dangerous thing uh, that, that could go on because the enemy could use you to discredit not even, you know, the ministry of, or try to discredit the ministry of deliverance, but other ministries as well, too. Like, you get in, involved in a ministry, and you're still engaged in sin. You're still engaged in, like, open, willful sin. You know, that is how the enemy uses, uh, you know, people to try to discredit uh, the ministry of God. So, I just want to, you know, talk about a testimony, actually. One time, a lady messaged me, um, I guess the the time frame isn't necessarily relevant, but she told me she got into deliverance ministry and she was still actively living in uh, fornication. She was living in open fornication and she was consistently doing deliverance for people. And she didn't notice like uh, destruction in her life immediately, but eventually she testified to me. I'm just telling you what she testified to me. Maybe this isn't the same thing that would happen for everybody, but her entire life literally got destroyed. Like certain of her family members got sick. She lost her house. She lost, I don't even remember all the details, but she pretty much communicated to me that she lost almost everything. And she attributes it to the fact of that she was still living in open fornication when she was in the ministry of deliverance. And I think this can make us understand that we really go under a lot of attacks that we don't realize. A brother was telling me before we started this uh, service that there's a lot of things that God does that we don't realize. Both are true. God does a lot of things in the details of our lives to try to protect us and try, you know, to do good things 
things for us and we don't recognize it. And the same is true with the attacks uh, from the enemy. There are so many attacks that we go through. There's so many missions. I believe that the enemy is on a mission against us. Against And even as we pe are people who are familiar with spiritual warfare, I think a lot of times we don't even recognize them. You know what I mean? So praise God for the grace of God because I believe Satan is hammering especially those who are in the ministry of deliverance every single day, but we just don't recognize the attacks of the enemy. So we shouldn't be uh, high-minded, you know, like the Bible says that we should take heed lest we fall. We should not think of ourselves more highly than we ought. And we should not uh, just, uh, you know, treat the ministry of deliverance as, as no big deal. You know what I mean? Because, the, like I said earlier, the enemy's going to try to come after you. You know what I mean? When you get in the ministry of deliverance, but... Praise God, it's, it's all worth it. Because when you truly walk in holiness, when you walk in righteousness, God delivers you from every evil attack. Paul said in the book of 2 Timothy chapter 4, The Lord shall deliver me from every evil attack and preserve me unto his heavenly kingdom. You know, when we're walking in holiness and we're walking in righteousness, we might actually uh, notice some of the attacks even less because the grace of God is there protecting us. But that doesn't mean that the attacks are not happening. You know what I mean? 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 11 says, Lest Satan should get an advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his devices, right? So uh, we shouldn't be ignorant of the devil's devices. We should be uh, well aware of what he's trying to do. And I'm not saying that, uh, you know, in every way that he's going to try to attack the, the ministry of deliverance, I'm not necessarily trying to say what, what's going to happen in the future. But I do believe that the enemy is going to try to discredit the ministry of deliverance as it continues to grow and explode. And he's going to, you know, try to have situations where it came out that deliverance ministers were in sin or to try to do like uh, different kinds of religious attacks against the ministry of deliverance, which I guess he's been doing that for a long time, right? And like I said earlier, we should not think it impossible that um, in the future, people would even be going to jail for deliverance. I believe it's very potential that in the future, they will, they could possibly, and this is just me speculating, this isn't like, a, you know, prophetic or anything. Well, maybe it is, I don't know. But I believe in, in the future, they could say something like, um, you know, uh, you need to have a, a psychology license in order to do deliverance. If you don't have a license, you're not qualified to do deliverance, um, you know, this it would be illegal for you. Or actually... Here's something else that's really possible as well, too. Me and my wife, uh, a little while ago, we were watching a video where, um, you know, Catholics were apparently doing exorcisms, which, you know, I don't believe, uh, you know, what, what's going on with the Catholics and all that. They think that they're casting demons out of people, but... I don't even believe Catholics are saved to begin with. I believe they have a false gospel. But anyways, that's a whole nother discussion. Um, the point that I'm trying to get across is, in the video, they were repetitively saying that this individual, this Catholic quote-unquote exorcist, that he was qualified by the Vatican. And they were putting him as a public spectacle. And multiple different times through the video, they were saying he's like the only one, one of the only um, you know, Catholic priests in uh, all of North America or in America that is a qualified exorcist or something like that. I'm not drawing any huge conclusion out of that. I just found it interesting and a little weird how they just continually kept saying how he was a qualified exorcist. You know, he was trained by the Vatican. He had that that qualification, you know, and I could see very well in the future, especially with the push of the new world, uh, the, the one world religion, where the Va Vatican and the Catholic Church is going to be a major piece of that, where they could say, like, these different religious practices need to fall under the qualifications of the Vatican. And I believe uh, one thing that they could try to make fall under that category could possibly be um, deliverance. I find it interesting how they would put, you know, a uh, Catholic priest in, uh, like, in a good light, per, um, per se, but they probably wouldn't do that with uh, an actual deliverance minister, right? So, um, anyways, I just found that interesting. I wanted to mention that with you guys. In closing with this message, I just want to say um, that we should do deliverance publicly and we shouldn't let anybody stop us from doing so. Like I said, if you got into the ministry of deliverance, it's just full steam ahead. You know, there's no turning back. And there's no turning back in the Christian walk to begin with. You need to put your hand to the plow and never look back when you're walking as a Christian. Any excuse that the enemy will try to give you to look back or to compromise or, or what you might get like some... Um, some temporal um, relief or whatever. In the end, it's going to come back to bite you. Because if you put your hand to the plow and you started following Jesus Christ, the enemy is going to come 
to destroy you. Like I said earlier, whether you turn back, whatever you do, you put that mark on your back now, um, you know, when you've ch chosen to follow the Lord and there, there's no point in turning back. You know what I mean? For, obviously for many other reasons than that as well too. And I just want to encourage people as well too to share their ministry, uh, their their deliverance testimony. You know what I mean? Even if you're not going to get involved in like uh, doing deliverance and casting demons out of people, don't bury your talent under the ground per se. You know, in Mark chapter five, when that man received deliverance, Jesus told him to go and tell everybody about the wonderful things that God has done for him. Right? So we should do the same. I I, I see many people receive deliverance. And then they go and bury it under the ground. They just want to receive their freedom. They want to receive liberation. But they never want to tell anybody about their deliverance testimony. They never. Go. And, and here's the thing as well too. A lot of people will receive deliverance, but they don't receive revelation on the ministry of deliverance. There's a difference. You know, you'll start off by receiving deliverance, but many times you don't make the connections. You don't realize actually what's going on and how the spirits come out and why a Christian could have a demon and whatnot. You know what I mean? You need to come to the place where the Father gives you revelation on the ministry of deliverance and you don't just merely receive deliverance as well too, which obviously receiving deliverance would be fine, but I would encourage people to not just stop there, but go on to learn about the ministry of deliverance as well too, and receive revelation from the Father. And with me saying this, this is why I believe many people could cast out demons, but they don't even realize a Christian can have a demon. You know what I mean? Because they're being used by God to cast out demons, but they haven't received revelation from the Father on the ministry of deliverance. Therefore, you know, they don't realize a Christian could have a demon even, right? One of my favorite verses with regards, or my favorite verse with regards to this topic is Luke chapter 10, verse 21. It says, In that hour Jesus rejoiced in spirit and said, I thank thee, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that thou hast hid these things from the wise and prudent and hast revealed them uh, unto babes. Even so, Father, for it seemed good in thy sight. So, yeah, with regards to actually making connections about what's going on spiritually, the Father needs to reveal it to you. And Jesus is saying right here that the Father has specifically and purposely hid it from certain people. You know what I mean? So therefore you need to, you know, just kind of step out of the way sometimes and allow the, the Lord to reveal it to people in, um, in his timing. So anyways, guys, this is pretty much what I wanted to say for this message. Be on the watch out for certain things that the enemy may be doing in the near future to try to attack the ministry of deliverance. And I mean, he's he's actively doing so all the time, like even putting doubts and fears and anxieties in people's heads right before they're, they're, they're going to receive deliverance. Like it's happening on a micro scale, and I believe it's going to be happening and is happening on a macro scale as well too. So this is why... I believe we should be able to give a, a defense for the ministry of deliverance. You know what I mean? Because deliverance is a doctrine, according to Mark chapter 1. When Jesus cast out a demon, the people said, what new doctrine is this, right? So you need to study the ministry of deliverance as though it's a doctrine that you're studying and you want to be able to articulate to people, um, you know, so that you can give a, a proper defense of it. And I have many videos on my channel of, of how to do so.